Two weeks before the attack on the embassy, an Al-Qaeda explosives expert arrived in Nairobi and began assembling a bomb powerful enough to reduce the building to rubble. Alawali and Jihad Ali were reunited in the bomb maker's rented house four days before the attack. Together, they went through the details of the plan. Meanwhile, the cell in Mombasa, which had smuggled in the explosives, was ordered to disperse. Leaving wives and children behind, they quietly slipped out of the country. On the morning of Friday, August the 7th, Alawali and Jihad Ali set off in a truck loaded with explosives. Alawali was carrying a gun and four grenades. Ellen Boomer had been working at the embassy for just four weeks. I can remember it as clear as if it was yesterday sometimes. I had my cappuccino, I did that every morning. I used to work as a driver at the agricultural office of the US Embassy, and I was getting prepared for a trip. Naomi Karonga worked for the Kenyan government in the 22-storey building right next door to the embassy. That morning of 7th August, Friday, I was in my office in a cooperative house, 10th floor. I was in the building across from the small parking lot that was in the rear of our embassy. I was speaking with the Minister of Commerce. That morning, I was at the back gate of the embassy, the place where vehicles load and offload parcels. On my way to the second floor, I stopped in first floor, near the bank, and there was a queue, so I decided to go ahead to my office. When the truck pulled up at the back of the embassy, Alawali jumped out and asked the security guard to open the gate. The guard was suspicious and played for time. I said, yes, I'll open the gate. That's my job. But I haven't got the keys at the moment. You'll have to go to the reception. Alawali reached for his grenades. It was just me and the driver. And, um, we were both standing there, and we heard this loud. We went to the window to see what is going on. Most people got up and went to the window. I said, what was that? And he said, oh, no, let me look. Stuck outside the gate, Jihad Ali decided the moment had come. Wadi Elias El Hajj born in Sidon, Lebanon, had traveled to Pakistan to work for a Saudi charity by 1983. He returned to the United States in 1985, where he would marry 18-year-old April Ray, an American citizen from Texas who had recently converted to Islam, gaining American citizenship in 1989. Struggling financially, he decided to move his family to Quetta, Pakistan. However, El Hajj had returned back to New York to run the Al Kifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn with the death of Mustafa Shalabi under mysterious circumstances. While running the Al Kifa Refugee Center, he met some of the extremists involved with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He then relocated to the Sudan, working under a secretary who is involved with Osama bin Laden. 
on January of 1990, Wadi al-Hajj is linked to the killing of a liberal imam in Tucson, Arizona, Dr. Rashad Khalifa, who preached at the Masjid Tucson. There is another mosque in Tucson, the Islamic Center, that is favored by radical Islamists, including al-Qaeda figures like al-Hajj. Many at the Islamic Center complain about Khalifa and his liberal views, such as allowing men and women to pray together. At some unknown later time, El Hajj will tell U.S. investigators that in January of 1990, he is visited by an unnamed, tall, bearded Egyptian man who says that he has come from New York. This man says he has come to Tucson to investigate Khalifa. El Hajj serves the man lunch at his house while the man continues to angrily complain about Khalifa. El Hajj will later tell investigators the man then leaves and he never sees him again. Later that month, on January 31st, 1990, Khalifa is found murdered in the kitchen of his mosque. Investigators suspect the unnamed man was sent from New York by radical Islamists there. Osama bin Laden had a base of support at the al Keeper Refugee Center in New York and a base of support in Tucson. El Hajj will later tell investigators that he thought Khalifa's murder was justified. Starting in 1991, the FBI will begin investigating El Hajj and he will be implicated in the murder of Khalifa, but there is not enough evidence to charge him. However, he will be indicted for lying about his knowledge of the murder. He also says that the murder is a good thing. Later, seven people will be indicted in Colorado on charges of conspiracy to kill Khalifa. All seven are believed to be members of al Farqa, a Muslim extremist group based in Pakistan that has been tied to terrorist activities. Six will be convicted and the seventh will flee the country. However, none of the seven are thought to have committed the murder. In 2009, the prime suspect, Glenn Cusford Francis, a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, will be arrested in Canada and charged and convicted for his murder. By March of 1991, the FBI begins to investigate Wadi al Hajj, who soon began work as bin Laden's personal secretary. The FBI is investigating the February 1991 murder of Mustafa Shalabi, the head of the Al Keeper Refugee Center, a charity with ties to both bin Laden and the CIA. El Hajj, a U.S. citizen living in Texas at this time, came to New York to briefly run Al Keeper so Shalabi can make a trip overseas and happened to arrive the same day that Shalabi was murdered. Investigators find a message from El Hajj on Shalabi's answer machine. They learn El Hajj has been connected to the 1990 murder of a liberal imam, Mustafa Khalifa. Further, he visited El Said Nasser, who had assassinated Rabbi Mir Kahani the year before on November 5th, 1990, in prison and left his name in a visitor's blog, in a visitor's log. However, the FBI decides there is not enough evidence to charge El Hajj with any crime. They lose track of him in early 1992 when he moves to the Sudan and begins working there as bin Laden's primary personal secretary. By 1994, Isam al-Ridi, an associate of Osama bin Laden, who previously purchased an aircraft for him, is asked to sell the aircraft by Wadi al Hajj. Al Haridi, who obtains a U.S. citizenship in 1994, agrees to check the plane out and try to sell it in Egypt, where he is living at the moment. Al Ridi goes to examine the plane, which is in Khartoum, Sudan. He travels through Nairobi, Kenya, because he is worried about surveillance by Egyptian intelligence and meets Al Hajj, who is now living in Nairobi. Upon arrival in Khartoum, El Hajj is met by Ilhab Al Nawawi, another bin Laden operative and US trained pilot. They find that the plane is in poor condition and try to repair it. However, both sets of brakes fail upon landing after a test flight and the plane crashes into a sandbank near the runway. The accident is noted by the tower and everybody else and is a major event because, as Al Ridi will later say in court, this aircraft was very unique to Khartoum. There was no such private aircraft at Khartoum International Airport. Al Ridi is extremely concerned because of bin Laden's notoriety and because everybody knows that it is a bin Laden's aircraft. 
He knows Egyptian intelligence in Khartoum will soon find out about the incident and will then come looking for him. So he's very concerned to leave and he takes the first plane out of the country. The CIA had been monitoring bin Laden in the Sudan since he moved there in 1991. And it would make sense that the CIA would learn of the accident due to the plane's known ownership by bin Laden. However, it is unclear if they do so and what action they take based on it, if any. During the Soviet-Afghan war, al Ridi had supplied bin Laden with assassination rifles in Afghanistan and later said that the CIA was aware of this transaction. By October of 95, the FBI is given the CIA files on bin Laden and they discover that the CIA had also been conducting a vigorous investigation on Wandi al Hajj. The FBI had already started investigating Hill Hajj in 1991, and in 1993, they found out he had bought several weapons for one of the 1993 World Trade Center bombers. Thanks to the CIA files, the FBI learns that in early 92, El Hajj moved to Sudan and worked there under bin Laden. Then in 1994, he moved to Nairobi, Kenya, and officially started a bogus charity there called Help Africa People. In fact, El Hajj is running as an Al Qaeda cell that will later carry out the 1998 Africa bombings. He stays in close contact with top Al Qaeda leaders, including Ayman al Zawahiri and Mohammed Atef. Apparently, El Hajj is also under US surveillance in Kenya, or at least people he is calling are under surveillance. For instance, a phone call between El Hajj in Kenya and Ali Mohammed in California is recorded in late 1994. And there are many calls recorded between Al Hajj and bin Laden in the Sudan. FBI agent Dan Coleman will analyze all this information about Al Hajj and eventually supervise a raid on his Kenya house on August 21st, 1997. However, the New York Times will later report that Ali Mohammed runs afoul of the bin Laden organization after 1995 because of a murky dispute involving money and no longer is trusted by bin Laden lieutenants. This is according to a 1999 court testimony from Khaled Abu El Dahab, the other known member of Mohammed Santa Clara, California, Al Qaeda cell. Another Al Qaeda operative in another trial will later claim that in 1994, Al Qaeda leader Mohammed Ataf refused to give Mohammed information because he suspected, suspected Mohammed was a US intelligence agent. However, despite these accounts, it seems that Mohammed continued to be given sensitive assignments. For instance, later in 1996, he will help bin Laden move from the Sudan to Afghanistan, and he will be in contact with many operatives in Kenya planning the East Africa bombings. On February 7th, 1997, U.S. intelligence monitoring the phones of an al-Qaeda cell in Kenya, as well as the phones of Osama bin Laden and other al-Qaeda leaders in Afghanistan. Between January 30th and February 3rd, 1997, Al-Qaeda leader Mohammed Atef calls Wadi El-Hajj, the leader of the Kenyan cell, several times. El-Hajj then, then flies to Pakistan, and on February 4th, he is monitored, calling Kenya, and gives the address of a hotel in Peshawar, where he is staying. On February 7th, he calls Kenyan cell member Fazul Abdul Mohammed, a.k.a. Harun Fazul, and says he is still in Peshawar, waiting to enter Afghanistan and meet al-Qaeda leaders. Then later on February 7th, Fazul calls cell member Mohammed Sadiq O'Day. According to a snippet of the call discussed in a 2001 trial, Fazul informs O'Day about a meeting between the director and the big boss, which are references to El Hajj and Osama bin Laden, respectively. In another monitor called around this time, Fazul talks to cell member Mustafa Fathil, and they complain to each other that O'Day is using a phone for personal business that is only meant to be used for Al-Qaeda business. Then on February 21st, El Hajj is back in Kenya and talks to O'Day on the phone in another monitored call. On August 21st, 1997, Dan Coleman, an agent working with Alex Station under the FBI, has been examining transcripts from wiretap phones connecting to Bin Laden's business in the Sudan. One frequently called number belongs to Wadi El Hajj. El Hajj often makes obvious and clumsy attempts to speak in code. The CIA comes to believe that El Hajj 
might be recruited as an agent. On this day, Coleman and two CIA agents and a Kenyan police officer enter El Hodge's house in Nairobi, Kenya with a search warrant. The investigators interview El Hodge and confiscate his computer. A large amount of incriminating evidence is discovered in El Hodge's documents and computer files. And shortly after August 21st, El Hodge moves to the United States where he is interviewed by a grand jury and then let go. He will be arrested shortly after Al Qaeda bombs the US Embassy in Nairobi. He would be sentenced to life in prison for the role in that attack. State Department officials will later strongly assert that while staffers at the US Embassy in Kenya were told about the raid at the time, they were not told about any potential connection to Al Qaeda. However, US intelligence officials strongly assert that the embassy staff was frequently briefed about the bin Laden connection. Shortly after September 15, 1998, in the wake of the US embassy bombings in Africa, the US arrests Wadi El Hajj. He is later convicted for his role in his bombings. Looking through his diaries, investigators discover a reference to a joint venture between Al Qaeda and the Holy Land Foundation, a charity based in Texas known for its support of Hamas. The name and phone numbers of a Texas man connected to Holy Land is also found in El Hodge's address book. The U.S. had considered taking action against Holy Land in 95 and again in 97. Yet, as the Wall Street Journal will later note, even when this evidence surfaced in 1998, suggesting a tie between the foundation and Osama bin Laden, federal investigators didn't act. On October 21st, 2001, four men are sentenced to life in prison for their roles in the East Africa embassy bombings. Wadi El Hajj, Kalfan Khanis Mohammed, Mohammed El Alwahi, and Mohammed Sadiq Oday. Another man in custody for the embassy bombings, Mamdou Mahmoud Salim, attempted to stab a prison guard and was removed from the trial and eventually given 32 years in prison for the stabbing instead. Double agent Ali Mohammed is also brought in custody and pleads guilty for a role in the bombings, but he is never sentenced and his fate remains murky. A New York jury considered the death penalty for some of them, but deadlocked on that opted for life in prison without parole instead. Hadi Hal Haj to this day never admitted to his role in the 1998 East Africa bombings. Him and his wife, to the very day, consider themselves victims and persecuted by the federal government into thinking they are terrorists. 